Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this latest session of Scaling Up. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, marketing goals and planning for the upcoming year of 2024. Um, and so how do we understand what our digital contribution should be in order to meet our business goals um, and scale our, our platforms for growth in the upcoming year? Uh, today, I am joined by a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Evan Ilgenfritz, who is the director of media here at Cardinal. He handles all the day-to-day -day running of, of campaigns, runs the media team, um, has a, a wealth of multi-location healthcare experience across different industries and verticals within the healthcare space um, and has helped run a ton of omni-channel paid media strategies um, to help grow those platforms um, and drive success for them. I'm also joined by Rob Sorter, who's the VP of Owned and Earned. Uh, he handles SEO, uh, creative, user experience, um, all kinds of things. He, uh, patient acquisition, patient retention, you name it. Uh, Rob does it. Uh, he's also worked on the media side as well. So he has vast knowledge and has been in uh, healthcare marketing for, I think, about 15 years, Rob. Um, and so he's worked with some big, big platforms, helping to drive patient acquisition and patient retention um, and, and brings a wealth of experience as well. So very excited to have them alongside me. I'm the chief strategy officer here at Cardinal. Uh, very heavily involved in, in analytics and uh, media offerings. And I've been at the company for 10 years and, and have worked with some of the, the best healthcare companies that, that the agency has had the pleasure to work with and call its clients. Um, and so hopefully we can uh, bring some expertise to the table here in terms of how to do proper goal planning uh, and make sure that we, we meet those goals in 2024. So without further ado, I'm going to make our guests do all the hard work here and tell us a little bit, Rob and Evan, and maybe Evan, I'll come to you first about your know, goal setting seems like something so fundamental, something that every company would have to do. And yet oftentimes when we, we, we begin to work with some of our clients, they tend not to have goals or not to have well-defined goals. So why is goal setting so difficult for a lot of platforms that we work with? It's a great question, Rich. I think, I think there's a variety of reasons and we, we talk about several of them here in this presentation. Um, sometimes it can be uh, uh, miscommunication between different teams uh, uh, in a business between upper management and the marketing team. Um, it can often be you know, challenges with, with uh, data attribution and reporting. Right. There are various uh, uh, reasons that maybe we're not connected or we don't have the information and it kind of stalls us out in setting goals. And so we think, let's just let's just get leads. Let's get something. But um, often we find without that guiding light of where we want to head that uh, it slows overall growth. Mm -hmm. And and Rob, from your experience, you know. Can be even diff more difficult, right, oftentimes, you know to forecasting paid media is hard enough, right? But trying to understand what organic can deliver from a, from a forecast and a plan point of view and setting goals against organic traditionally has been considered very difficult. But I know that's something that you guys are working towards on your side, right? In terms of how do we set meaningful goals for channels that aren't in the paid media realm? Yeah, you suffer from the same challenges in organic. Um but a few additional ones that you don't see in paid um, things like algorithm updates are not always, you know, forecasted ahead of time. And the impact can be unknown uh, until those things roll out. Um, obviously, things like organic can be impacted by large website changes, you know, acquisitions, et cetera, that can make it difficult. But at the end of the day, it's key for organic professionals to get as comfortable as possible in the data. Uh, and, and making that best case uh, that best case forecast, right? Um, there's sort of no excuse, in my opinion, right, for the organic space not to be a little more uh, confident, right? Uh, and there's a myriad of data there to leverage. Um, so th it's in any forecast, right? You can't predict the future. Every forecast is wrong. Um, but how do you crunch that cone of confidence as tight as possible and try to come up with something that you're confident in? And then you you, know, you adjust the plan, right, as you you attack that fiscal year. So. We've talked about some of the mistakes briefly about you know why we don't necessarily have clear goals 
Um, you know, and again, it's not just the binary thing, right? If I have goals or I don't have goals, the specificity of goals is really important, right? But sure. what what is the negativity? What is the the negative consequence in your experience, guys, of working with a platform that doesn't have goals? What what ends up happening there in in those circumstances when when we're trying to do digital marketing with no defined end game or target inside? Sure, uh, it's a great question. From the digital side of things, it's often manifests in um, making the wrong strategic decisions or putting money in the wrong location, right? Um, if you uh, if, if it's unclear whether we need to go after uh, certain types of services or overall volume or even um, the expectations of performance from different channels, you might be doing the wrong things and not in fact driving uh, the results and therefore ultimately the right business objectives for the, for each business. Mm -hmm. Rob, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, right? We're in a world of math, you know, outcomes and algorithms, and all of those operate on an independent variable, right? A goal, something you're optimizing towards. If you don't know what that is, I don't understand how you can make the right prioritization and sort of executional decisions, right? Um, you really need to know, sure, we want volume and we want quality right but you you can optimize to those two things very very differently right uh, so you have to kind of agree uh, and come together as a team uh, including right leadership and really a, as, a, as an entire business uh and kind of agree on that because it makes the decision making much more expedited and it makes your program far more optimized and, and direct right um I, I, I honestly i don't know how you have a lot of success if you can't come up with some good goals yeah, and so you bring up a great point, Robin. Let's let's kind of jump into that about how you get how you how you perform the function of goal planning, and then how you get that alignment organizationally. And I think I'm going to let you cover this one, Rob, because you, you you already alluded to it, right? But I think part of the issue of getting clear goals to an agency partner is that first everybody inside the organization needs to be on the same on the same page, right? In terms of what the goals actually are. Yeah, and it usually comes in the form of top down and bottoms up, right? And I like to kind of collide those two things together, right? So from the top down, you're usually going to see a business from a financial standpoint, have a growth goal, right? They'll, you know, generally a business will say, we want to grow 20% or 30%, you know, this year. And uh, you, you also need to look at it from sort of the bottoms up from a digital standpoint and say, you know, what do we have? Uh, how do we contribute to that goal? What are our channels? What are our opportunities? Uh, what can we rely on um, on our side? And what, what do we think we can accomplish? Um, and when they're not aligned, then you get to have the really interesting discussions on, you know, what do we need to get them aligned, right? Is there a budget gap, right? Is there a talent gap? Is there a, you know, channel gap? Uh, and you can kind of kind of tackle those problems from that perspective. But, you know, to add to that, you know, I'll give you a really simple example, right? Um, you could ask, someone in our space, a pretty easy question to understand if they have clarity on their goals, right? So, you know, what's more important, right? A total lift in new patients or a specific lift in new patients that targets certain locations with capacity, right? Are you looking to fill and balance capacity across all of your locations or are you just looking for the most patients possible, right? Very different ways to optimize to those two things. Very different channel mix, I would say, is required to accomplish those two things, right? Like completely different strategy. Um, so if you start with a client and say, you know, you just want more patients and they say, yes, you're not, you're not even close, right? To the, to the end of that, that goal discussion, uh, it gets a lot more granular than that. Yeah. And Rob, uh, again, it's like, it's almost like you've seen this deck before. Great segue into, I think something that Evan, you were going to just help us understand is how do we set the goals by needs, right? I mean, I think like Rob makes a great point of, I think pe different people inside the organization may have a different driving need and even different people who work with the organization. Like we work with a lot of PE backed companies where maybe the PE firm, they want total patient growth is their number one goal, but where you have operational people who are like, no, I've got to get 10 patients into location A tomorrow and I'm willing to pay double the CPA to do that, right? Because there are seats that need to be filled. So how, how does an organization come together both internally and with its external partners to set those clear goals by need? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, 
we, what we see here on the slide is, is a lot of different things that may be a priority, right? Lowest acquisition costs, more volume. Um, is it about capacity by location? Is it about certain service types and the revenue uh, attached to them? Um, a lot of most businesses are not fully mature in their their marketing strategy yet. It, it takes a lot of time and many ch a lot of channels um, that we're running and um, attribution analysis. So the main point here is that while the answer might be i want all of them all of the above please right i want more volume more specificity better location support it may realistically not be possible and can be detrimental to try to do all of these at once a good example would be uh, um i think as we've touched on is uh, the difference between going after total lead volume versus location level support that often can't be done simultaneously. When you when you begin to restrict your focus or your marketing dollars by location, the the platforms tend to not be able to deliver as high volume. So th this is super important to kind of lay out these needs before we even talk about numbers. I think this is the very first stage. Is like what what in theory are we looking to drive? If it's all of the above, what's the first most important thing? Let's start there and plan against the other items as we move into the future. Right, prioritizing, you know, from, from most impactful to least impactful That's right. to understand what you may have to give up. And I think, you know, oftentimes what happens is you want everything, but there are fixed elements that influence your goals, right? So either you have a finite budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you don't have enough budget to fill capacity at every single location and you have to say well actually shooting for an 80 percent capacity rate is is good enough maybe you have the opposite problem right where you have a finite number of providers at very high performing locations and you've got to the point where digital could drive infinite amount of leads at, a, at an efficiency that you want to go for but you just don't have enough providers to actually ratchet up that capacity quickly enough where it would make sense to do so mm -hmm. so there's always oftentimes we, we we work in very few scenarios where it's just wide open space runway where you can just kind of go infinitely and it's just an exponential curve mm -hmm. there is usually something that's that's um that's a, that we can't break through that's actually constraining us in some way and that will very much influence what the goals have to be whether it's a like I said, a fixed budget amount or a fixed capacity, um, there's usually something that's that's preventing us from just you know going and getting all the patients in the world at a certain cost per patient at a certain CAC. Um, but beyond once those things have been determined and you've you've prioritized what you want your goals to achieve, I think, Rob, then the language of how you translate those goals is is very important, right? And and one of the things that we often see is provided platforms putting their hand up and saying, or, or, you know, healthcare providers putting their hand up and saying, yeah, I've got goals. And then you ask them what the goal is. And it's like, oh, it's a $50 CPA or something like that. But but can you tell us a little bit about where that falls short, right? When, when not yeah. all goals are cool, right? Well, look, I'll pick on that one because it's an easy one, right? There's a huge difference between guidelines and goals, especially good goals that are aligned to the business. Right. So if a client were to come to me and say, I want to a $200 cost per lead from digital, I'd say, great, we'll spend $200 in brand search. I'll get you 10 leads, $20 cost per lead, mission accomplished. Right. They'd probably look at me and say, no, you're out of your mind. We need more than 10 leads. It's like, that's always your, that wasn't what your goal said. Right. Your goal just said be efficient. I just spent $200 wildly efficiently and crush your goal. Right. Uh, so clearly not a good goal, better guideline. Right now, when you talk more about, you know, we need 5% patient growth year over year, it starts to get better, right? Uh, still vague because it, you know, it doesn't necessarily qualify where, right? Or how uh, it doesn't qualify some specifics around, you know, maybe they open a new location, bang, right? 5% growth, right? Mission accomplished, right? Probably again, not what they mean, right? They're probably looking for increased growth within certain channels with increased certain, you know, from certain budget lines. Uh, you know, you really want to make sure you're, granular you understand what it got what guidelines are required and what, what are guidelines uh and where that separates specific goals right so it kind of ties together some of the slot uh, you know previous few slides we've talked about but you know are these the business goals right uh are these accomplishing what we need to accomplish as a team right and are they to your point specific enough that we can action against them uh and kind of report back on them right uh so 
yeah, I, I think you, you kind of if you kind of set, set them aside and look at them one by one, uh, pick on it the way I sort of did, right? It can kind of help you pressure test, right? Are my goals good enough, or are there, you know, for my examples, borderline silly ways to achieve the goal? which shows that it really wasn't, you know, specifically that business version of success, right? Obviously the CEO in that example would not come and give you a hug, right? Uh, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't help get the business where it needs to go. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be like six months into the year and you've driven, you know, only leads at one location because it was super efficient. You may have hit your efficiency and your volume goal, but you've not actually helped support the other 10 locations in your portfolio and they're all closing their doors, right? That would be a disastrous outcome. So I think more time you spend up front thinking about these things, uh, the better it will be in terms of the performance you'll drive and the business impact you'll have. So, you know, one of the other things that I, I wanted to touch on briefly too is, once you've got strong goals and they're really grounded in achieving the, the, the business objective, then those goals must also be you know, grounded in a realistic forecast, right? So if you have a budget of $100,000 and you need to drive 10,000 patients and let's say organic is, SEO is just starting out and isn't driving a whole ton and maybe won't for maybe three to six months, that means that for, you know, potentially what you're going to have to do is drive a $10 cost per patient or a $15 cost per patient. Maybe you work in an industry where you're paying a $15 cost per click or even more, right? Rob and I were looking at uh, an industry that had a $45 cost per click yesterday. So obviously, if that's the case, you're not going to be converting 200% of the clicks that you drive, right? So you, it's, it's great to have goals. But the goals must be grounded in the reality of the real world and the competitive set um, and, and the market conditions that you're operating within, right? And so especially if you're a new MSO and you have very little organic support at this point or you have very little reputation or brand awareness in the market, um, it's going to be more costly in those early years, right, to drive patient acquisition. Um, you know, if, depending on how, how many... Uh, how much competition you have in a particular market, what the total addressable market is that you're chasing, how much demand there is in that market, how much education has to happen. You know, these are all things that could really impact the, the performance. So you, you must uh, gut check and uh, you know, benchmark performance and understand if what you're setting out from a digital contribution goal is, is manageable. Uh, because the last thing you want to do is get C-suite alignment on a set of goals and digital contribution. And then you as the marketing person is going back to them and saying, cool, we can maybe achieve 10% of this, right? <laughs> because they all got aligned and excited on something and then you burst their bubble. So better to do some of this work up front, we would recommend to make, you know, to make sure that it is doable and it is possible uh, before you guys get fully aligned on, on what the goal should be. All right. And then Rob, you know, like once we've got these goals and we feel good about them, we fact check them. Um, we've got to tell everybody about them, right? We've got to, we've got to get everybody thinking the same way. Yeah. And I think that's, that's key, right? I think it's so easy in marketing to find ourselves in silos, right? Be it a paid silo or an organic silo, a creative silo, right? Uh, but in the reality of it, you know, there's two ways to look at it, right? The first way is everything's interconnected, right? There's obviously, you know, what often is referred to as a halo effect, right? And, you know, cross-channel integrated impact, right? But from the same point, I almost find it more important to look at it from the consumer's point of view, the patient's point of view, right? They're interfacing with your brand as sort of a sole entity, right? And you need that that communication of not just the goals, but, you know, the way or which you're going to attack them so you can have that same continuity right? That same consistency. Um, and to the, you know, speak to the graphic on the page, right? That everyone's rowing in the same direction, right? Um, you, you hear a lot nowadays in, in sort of the business space of, you know, removing sales, removing marketing, right? And heading towards the idea of revenue teams, right? Teams that are responsible for driving revenue for the organization and treating them as a holistic group, right? It's a big, you know, big trend you're seeing, you know, Forrester and Gartner and some of those places as far as how enterprises are evolving. And I think there's a lot of value in that narrative, right? Because at the end of the day, all, all all of us, right? I think even Alex said in one of the 
earlier sessions, right? Like everyone's in sales, right? We're all here to help the business grow and um, making sure those goals are communicated clearly and everyone understands where where we're headed. Um, it enables them, right? It enables all of us, right? To help help achieve them. Yeah, and Rob, Rob I want to add too that, you know, there's, there's a handful of elements that, that you want to keep aligned. Everybody is working towards the same objective as you kind of alluded to, right? There's creative teams, there's organic teams, there's web development, there's paid media. Really, the the objectives is, is are all the same. They have minor nuances between them on how they're going to achieve them. But um, we're a big fan of, of documenting and referring back to, of course, financial objectives that are business-wide, but also, um, as we mentioned before, business priorities. Let's all talk about the main business priorities in the near term and how each team is working to attack the, sim- the same problems, right? They're not disparate. They're not, they're not being treated separately. We're all marching in the same direction. That's one of the biggest things we found because when once teams start splitting off and there's too many things to keep track of and everyone's doing it different things, then communication tends to break down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, help you say no, right? That's a key point of strategy. A key part of having a strategic approach is being able to say no, right? No, we can't do that project you just threw at us, you know, for this month, right? We have goals to achieve. And this thing that you just asked for, it doesn't go in the direction of where we're headed, right? It doesn't help us achieve these goals. We need to consider deprioritizing or honestly removing this project, right? If we intend on staying true uh, to the goals we set. Yep. Absolutely. We'll grow faster if we don't get distracted, right? Um, so how do we build, our, you know, now that we have our goals, we've got to be able to measure them and validate, them, right? That's a key point. It's no good having goals. Um, and then we start at the end of the beginning of the year and we get to the end of January and we have no idea how many patients we've driven, right? So we can't make the adjustments that are needed. Um, we can't do the work that's actually going to move the needle if we aren't able to measure these things properly. So Rob, you know, I think one of the big things that we always see is, you know, we'll get into an analytics solution or we'll get into an ads platform and we'll see conversions. And conversions are often not new patients, right? So the big question is, can you correlate your digital conversions with your patient growth, right? And and can you kind of walk us through a little bit about how we think about this as, a, as, an, as an agency. Yeah, so this is tricky, right? Because there's a lot of different ways this happens in the healthcare space, right? Some businesses have far more steps in this process, right? Some businesses have to have, you know, upfront discussions. Some, you know, some have to have, um, you know, in-person visits even, right? Before you can even convert into an actual patient. Uh, but the idea is, regardless of what your business is or where you're at from a digital maturity you know, the effort is still the same, which is can you create a sort of as deep in the funnel, you'd like to say full funnel, but that's difficult to do, right? So for each organization, you want to ask how far into the funnel can you get, right? How deep can you reach? Um, And are there some assumptions that you could potentially create to help skip or jump steps where a technology or, you know, some other, uh, you know, loop closing solution isn't available? But you have to come back to that, right? You have to come back to those assumptions, um, you know, at least quarterly, I would say, right? Aggregate numbers are very dangerous, right? If you just go out there and say, well, on average, right, we convert from a di- you know digital conversion um, to a patient 10% of the time, right? It's like, that's on average, right? Based on probably the current stack, the current, you know, plan, the current budget, right? Like if, you, if we change channels, if we change approaches, right, that number could go way up, it could go down, Um it's hard, right? It's hard to operate the business that way. So at the end of the day, you know, you just want to figure out how deep into this funnel can we get? Um, and I've worked with a lot of CMOs, right? That said, you know, the the bane of the CMO is the vanity metric, right? You got to get, you got to get to the business metric. Um, otherwise you could be celebrating and marketing while the business yeah. is cruising downhill. Yeah, build- <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and And to build on that, right? It's like, the first thing you can do is is to to Rob's point, like how deep can we get? But look at look at anything that's not deep and not helping you. You know, one of the things one of the things that is like my pet peeve when we look at accounts that we take over is we'll see things like click to calls or calls that are over ten seconds in duration. 
oftentimes a 10 second phone call does not mean that that is a new patient appointment that is that has just happened right like there is no correlation between the length of a phone call oftentimes and whether or not that was a more qualified call because when existing patients call you they're asking about billing questions they're asking about rescheduling appointments guess what these things take a long time right these are not quick calls so just make sure that it's not only how deep you can get but when you get to a level that is deep make sure that your logic for trying to tie the conversion as closely as possible to a new patient engagement is is as tight as possible but the good news is you can get pretty deep right so we work with a lot of um awesome companies um if you've attended some of the other scaling up sessions that i've been on um over the last couple of days you probably heard me talk about these these groups um but there are technological solutions out there that will allow you to track new patient appointments both through online booking through calls and even through form submissions inbound form submissions that generate an outbound call there is a way to understand how many of those forms then once they're called back turn into new patient appointments and not only do these platforms allow you to measure new patient volume in terms of new patient appointments but they allow you to send those signals to the advertising platform and to your analytics platform um, and to some of your HIPAA compliant analytics platforms as well because hopefully we've all you know at this point started to look at GA4 and go yeah that's not compliant I probably want to back away from that and get rid of that tag um, but there are ways to do it and obviously if you are now measuring new patient appointments through all the different lead mechanisms that you have available on your website, and you know some of these technologies can actually dedupe those engagements, right? So if I come through a form and I call, it knows that I'm one person that booked one appointment, right? So it's not going to count me as two appointments. It's going to it's going to marry that data, dedupe me, and count me as one appointment. Obviously, if I have those signals for measurement and optimization, I'm much closer to that business objective of driving 50 new patients at location A. And I know that I've driven 50 new patient appointments through Google ads and SEO and Facebook, et cetera. So it's getting much closer to a one-to-one -one, uh, measurement and optimization approach rather than we drove a hundred clicked calls, which may or may not have resulted in a single patient. So the technology is out there. If you want to know more about it, feel free to reach out to us. We can put you in touch with these guys, um, but we we recommend that you harness it and get the right signals for both measurement and optimization. All right. But we realize that that's a perfect world. And oftentimes, you know, we don't want to put the brakes on having goals and trying to measure those goals until we've got the perfect MarTech stack set up. So Evan, what can we do? I mean, Rob, Rob already kind of alluded to it in terms of specificity and and, and time leads back to uh, patients, but how can we leverage proxies to fill in any data gaps that we may have at least temporarily? Sure. There's a couple, a couple things to consider. One, first, it's an absence of, of true goals or objectives. The other might be um, the absence of clear data that helps us count towards them, right? So in both of these instances, the, the main takeaway is having a goal to aim at is one of the first steps of improving performance. It's when we're stuck in a cycle of, we think we need a $200 lead and that's kind of the end of the story, then growth uh, tends to stagnate. So set setting, you know, being prepared to set proxy goals if we don't truly have one or to set proxy values or performance requirements um, to get us closer to where we need to be is really an important step. So as Rich mentioned, first, first step is as close as you can get to a meaningful kind of qualified um, lead type. As he mentioned, click to call is not typically good. If we can get a lead, that's a great place to start at least. Um, as best we can, there's a lot of times when, when the tech stack in the back end, we can't see there's different businesses, you know, um, under the same umbrella running different systems so they can't speak to each other. Um, this is when we want to make sure that we can at least get a general sense of if we have um, 100 leads that come in um, and we get 20 patients out of them, then now we know the conversion rate between leads to patients at the very least, right? So starting there, it might not be perfect. You're not, it might not even be that you know that it's from paid search or paid social, 
but at least we can start taking this assumption and applying it um, and then monitoring the results as we go. So that would be, okay, then, then I know I need, um, you know, five times as many leads as I need uh, for, for the patient count I need. So let's set those objectives of lead volume, uh, whether it's in search, social, different channels, um, bid appropriately to them within your budget and then measure if that did in fact drive end patients. up drive the patients you were hoping for. And as, and as Rob was alluding to, if you are a multi-location business, do not do this at the system level, do it at the location level, do it at the practice level, right? Because we know that practice A, it might take 10 leads to drive, you know, five patients and practice B, it might take so, 20 leads to drive five patients, right? right? So we shouldn't be applying the same ratio to every every practice inside of the system. That's right. All right. So a little bit on value-based bidding as well, Evan, you know, this is a uh, another way that we can essentially lean into conversions that are worth more, that, that have a higher propensity to turn into patients. So talk to us a little bit about value-based bidding. Sure. But same, same with setting proxies um, with, with, with different lead types. What we also know is that different lead types perform differently. That's almost universally. It doesn't matter that they often change position for different businesses, but calls and forms and online bookings tend to never perform the exact same as each other. Mm -hmm. um, so another great step, once you have some proxy values of okay, leads, now let's let's move the needle more towards efficiency by identifying what lead type we found is more valuable. So again, take, looking at the graph here, we've got if the patient lifetime value is 2,500 um, and the different percentage of, of a point, you know, call appointments, 85% of them become patients versus 45 from form submissions, we can just apply a basic value um, particularly in Google ads that allows us to assign a value to this lead type and either um, monitor and try to manually, maybe we we deprecate forms or we do some other methods to reduce them, or we use smart bidding um, and value-based bidding to tell the system, please go get me more. I, I want all of them, but please try to bring me more calls than forms because ultimately that drives higher value for us. Yeah, and, and, and uh, even though SEO can't, take advantage of this in the exact direct way that you just said in terms mm -hmm. of bidding algorithm, it can help inform SEO strategy, right? That's because, right. you know, if you're looking at these numbers, you can say, okay, if I can drive calls, if I can focus on driving calls for organic, that is almost twice as valuable than driving form submissions for organic. Mm -hmm. So I should be looking at organic strategies that are really helping to drive call volume because that's going to lead to more explosive patient growth. That's right. All right. So now that we have goals and that we've come up with a brilliant way of measuring them, now it's time to understand how we can achieve those goals in terms of which channels play a part and how well they work together. So let's get into that a little bit. So Rob, I know that you gifted Cardinal with this visual. And so I'm going to let you talk a little bit about, you know, all the different digital channels in the mix and, and how we should think about the roles that they play in terms of achieving uh, uh, patient goals. Yeah, and it's 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 one of those areas where you wanna start with some known assumptions, right? Cross-channel integrated digital marketing isn't new, right? It's been around for a long time. Lots of different industries are running it. We have some idea of how the uh, channels play together, but there's still that element of first party, which means how do your specific channels play together? And that's gonna be different for everybody, right? And it will depend on lots of things. It depends on, your brand presence, you know, in certain, even in, by market, right? If you have a very high brand presence in a market, you might get more out of a PR and social media push than when you're trying to break into a new market and the competition is really dense and you have low saturation, right? So it's one of the things you really have to kind of test for and kind of understand that specific nature of, of, of the interaction. However, there are still ways to leverage the mix, um, you know, sort of correctly to drive those long-term outcomes, right? You know, the, the I love the idea of, the strength of paid media, for example, being that high level of control, right? You can decide specifically which type of product or which type of service you want to drive at which location, right? Based on, you know, adjusting levels of spend, right? And that impact can happen overnight. 
right? Whereas SEO is something you need to be more strategic in, but can have amazing efficiencies, especially once you embed yourself um, in those areas, right? And then you get to sort of the hard part, which is how do how can we make all those things play together, right? Uh, I love the paid search and SEO example, right? Like that's just search. It's all on the same landing page, right? For people in Google, they type in a term and bang, right? You get organic and you get paid. Right. Um, and in my past, we've, you know, leveraged strategies and something, some, some very simple, uh, very simple example of how these could work together is the idea of this rent, own and dominate strategy. Right. Um, and it's simple, right? Renting is you pay, right? When you stop paying, you don't have that space anymore. Own is where you build that own strategy from an SEO perspective. And then you actually create certain keywords where you actually want to dominate. And you say, you know what? The return on these keywords is so high and the competitive nature is potentially high and the value of winning in these spaces is so high that we want both to be present, right? We want to overlap our SEO strategy and our paid strategy to really, really focus in on this one core or multiple core areas um, and really drive that, right? So, you know, that's just one one very good search example, but you also see lots of others, um, you know, for example, when you measure a lot, uh, I've seen, and I think we actually have a case study on it right here in the deck, um, you know, top of funnel, has a big impact on things like SEO, right? And this is a good example just to talk a little bit about, you know, if someone wasn't paying close enough attention, they might have thought that in this pre post test analysis, that social media wasn't effective. In fact, wildly ineffective, right? A complete waste of money, right? So to take a step back, what this slide is showing, there's a lot to build into the slide here, right? But I'll try to cover it quick. This is a test on some de novo, uh, de novo net, net new launches, right? And what we did uh, was we tested a, uh, we initially launched uh, and we had a very bottom funnel, very search centric campaign, right? Um, and we measured the results. And then after a certain threshold, we went live with a much more top of funnel, social programmatic driven campaign. And it drove, obviously, uh, the money can go extremely far when you're doing engagement, right? And sort of visibility campaigns in media, right? You can get sort of the cost per view as opposed to cost per conversion. We're able to get that message out to tons, tons, tons more of more people, more eyes, uh, more engagement. Um, but the interesting thing is what grew other than the total, right? Of course, the total number of phone calls grew significantly, but the channel that benefited by far the most from that organic, I'm sorry, programmatic and social push was the organic SEO. Right. Uh, so this is, again, a good example of identifying a very specific interplay between channels. And again, to maybe the average marketer who wasn't approaching this um, from an integrated standpoint, they would say, man, boy, did we waste a lot of money on social and programmatic, but we should put a ton of money into SEO because for some reason, SEO just popped off. Right. And we should double down. Right. So obviously, you know, I'm, I'm making light of the situation, but this is a really clean and frankly, very successful example of uh how the different channels play together and why it's so important to understand that interplay so you make the right decision. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and it is critical when you're thinking, especially when you have finite resources, to Rob's point, you know, if you just go all the way down to the bottom of the funnel to try and drive the most efficiency, but you don't understand that SEO is reliant on top of the funnel and middle of the funnel channels then you're never going to hit your volume goals, right? And you're going to come way up short. And then maybe you're going to be scrambling to try and push more dollars into paid media and become less efficient. So understanding as much of these factors up front is, is really crucial. The other thing too is, you know, one of the things that we encourage for and we'll get into in the example is think about a blended CAC, right? Oftentimes what we, a uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction is, to think about performance at the channel level, right? As, as Rob was saying, you know, oh, organic's crushing it, but paid social and programmatic suck. A more sophisticated way to do it, especially with the interplay that we've just shown, is really to think about a blended CAC, right? Like how much would I pay across all digital channels to drive a patient? Because they are essentially all had their parts to play in pushing people through that patient journey. Um, even though, you know, if you looked at them in isolation, some would not look like they are contributing in the way that you would need them to, to continue them as a standalone, uh, as a standalone tactic. So this is a conversation that we're often having with clients, thinking about blended CAC, thinking about blended CAC volume, all these channels do interplay with one another. Um, and, and, you know, you also want to start thinking about too, like external costs, right? Maybe it's not just S, you know, media fees and you're looking at your CAC that way, but thinking about, 
SEO fees, uh, media fees. You know, there's other costs in here that you could throw into the CAC to get a true sense of what it's actually costing you to acquire a new patient. So again, when we're thinking about getting as close as we can in terms of marrying real performance with your goal, having a blended CAC that, that takes into account as much cost as possible is the way to get there. Yeah, it's a team, right? Just use any metaphor you want, sports or otherwise, right? You don't want a basketball team with five Shaquille O'Neal, right? Yeah, he scores a ton of points, right? He's dominant in the paint, right? But it doesn't make sense, right? You need to build a balanced team and you you judge the success on how the team played, right? It doesn't matter if Shaq scored the most points if you lose by 30, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a simple thing, but I think it's super, super important. Absolutely. So I know that Ashley always wants us to provide practical examples to the folks who, who watch these webinars. So we talked about a lot of great highfalutin ideas. How do we put this into practice? So Evan, talk us through step one. Where, where do we, I need, new, I need goals for 24. I don't have them. Where do I get, how do I get going? Yeah. Uh, happy to help. Uh, in, in this in this presentation and in how we think you should think about these goals is always to start zoomed all the way out, right? So starting the first step is let's outline the business-wide objectives, right? Let's be channel or source agnostic. Let's just have a conversation first about what, what is it, if, if you get this total number of patients, is everyone high-fiving and, and having parties? Have you met your business goal, right? So um, definitely want to make sure when we lay this out that we utilize business priorities and revenue data to inform any service type or location level objectives, right? You'll see here on the chart in this example that we've got locations, which is a common, I know a bunch of us in this in this uh, uh, summit here um, have businesses that are multi-local, um, as well as a, we're using an example here of uh mental health of mental health business. So medication management, psychiatry therapy, these are different service lines, right? And these typically have different revenue points and, and priorities. So definitely make sure that when we set our total goal, are we assessing these elements? Um, and also don't forget um, right now in this, in this chart, we're looking at just a simplified January example. Of course, you would want to build this out for quarters of the year. Um, but you'll want to, as you do that, plan the volume that you see here by month, by quarter against seasonality and expected business growth. Are we launching new locations that will require greater volume? Are we going to expand our service offerings beyond these service types you see here? All right. And so once we've done that initial legwork, then we're going to take it down a level, right? And we're going to start right. trying to understand what the contribution needs to be by channel. So walk us through both, you know, Rob and Em, would love to get your thoughts on this, right? Sure. Like how do we start to pick apart what each component piece needs to drive to, to meet that goal requirement? Yeah, uh, uh, excellent. So again, to keep this simple, we're from the previous slide, we're using location A. Let's just look at one location. Um, and what we've laid out here, you'll see um, in the rows are, again, those service types. We're looking at, at location A. And then, of course, the channels here you see in the column. So, Rob, starting with you, um, one of the elements here is, is trying to plot out what we expect from organic and direct. Of course, referrals, is we, we want to include that because that's often a very big source of leads, but is not directly related to, to digital acquisition necessarily. But so, Rob, talk us through a bit of how we how we start this. Yeah, you know, we talked earlier in the presentation, uh, earlier in the summit about, you know, having a strategy around SEO. And I think we heard some really cool examples this morning around referral and, you know, even some of the feet on the street, et cetera, opportunities, right? So you, you need to look at those strategies. Uh, you want to understand the performance, right? You want to understand the investment you're making, right, in organic and referral uh, and, and try to come to a confidence, again, a, a cone of confidence on expectation from those channels, right? How have you seen the competitors move? How are you seeing growth and visibility, right? What are some of those leading metrics? What are some of the, um, you know, pro what's the progress you're making there? Uh, and what do you expect, right? Um, in regards to overall growth out of the organic and referral space. So similar, right? Uh, similar to paid, um, you're just looking at it, but a few different, a few different variables to consider. Um, and, and that starts to set that 
that baseline, right? So then sort of that that sort of went in, you know, in, in our relationship, right? I would metaphorically kind of pitch the ball over to Evan, right? And say, all right, here's where the broad brush stroke, um, here's what we're confident, right? That we're going to be able to drive right now. How, how can we put the rest of this piece of the puzzle together, right? And, you know, kind of flip it to Evan to say, how do we attack the, how do we attack the gap? That's right. I mean, th again, we're just laying out what we need here. And what, once we've, once, you know, Rob and team or the SEO group has kind of laid out what they expect um, and what they plan to deliver, then media comes in for like the more, uh, uh, is more able to contribute and support immediately directly um, to help close the gap and hit the total goal. A couple things to consider. Um, it often might be good uh, uh, it, when you're budgeting paid media to maybe overshoot the total you might need to hit the goal, uh, just in case some of the other channels, uh, um, you know, they have a light month, right? So that's something to consider. Um, and finally, both in organic and paid media, um, always plan to, uh, uh, you, you can conservatively increase some of the forecasts we have based on the planned work, right? We, we, we typically don't want to set out our expectation for the year at exactly the performance level it's at right now, right? Let's, let's, let's increase our expectations, but do it in a way that's conservative and realistic. All right. So we've figured out what our channel contribution needs to be in terms of that first tier of what is organic going to contribute? What are we going to get in terms of provider referrals? And now we have this gap that paid media needs to account for. So obviously there's multiple tactics inside of paid media. So how would we go about determining, you know, where the spend, where that budget needs to be best used to drive that patient volume? That's a great question. I hope, uh, let, don't please don't be overwhelmed by the amount of numbers on the screen. But the main uh, uh, point of this is to take those priority service lines, medication management, psychiatry and therapy, now that we know in the previous step what we outlined as media's obligation, you could say, let's then go to the channels we use. In this instance, we're, we're this is an example where we're currently running paid search and paid social, right? So we've laid out the need. We know the need for each of these service lines and for media's contribution. Now let's go into how performance has been across these channels and can cor correctly allocate the funds, right? Um, so uh, across the board, you'll you'll see here paid search uh, in our experience in, in, in um, some of these instances often has a bit uh, uh, sharper performance than paid social, but both are great performers. Um, the balance there is often, you know, some of the instincts might be to give all your money to paid search instead of paid social. Rob mentioned earlier that that often the halo, you lose the halo effect that improves the other channels if you do that. Um, and the other reason is often that you can't just continue increasing funding in one channel and expect it to always perform or improve, right? There will be diminishing returns. So here, what we're looking at is let's identify the channel that performs the most efficiently and, and provide an amount of budget and expected lead volume that we need or, or, or patient volume that we need that can be realistically attained within the parameters of the channel, right? So mm -hmm. if we look across, we just quickly see that uh, a little bit more out of paid search, the budgets are a bit higher, but we do expect and need that lift from social and the net result um, can be seen at the bottom. And I think the key thing here, right, which touching back on some content that we talked about earlier is the further down the funnel you can go with your signals, mm -hmm. the more confident you can be of That's these right. decisions that you're making, right? right? And if you have a HIPAA compliant analytic solution where you're running some kind of multi-touch attribution, again, the more confident that you can be in the decisions that you're making. So having the right MarTech set up makes these, these uh, decisions much, much easier That's right. to validate and feel confident about. It. That's right. In this example, we're, we're really using cost of uh, a full patient start acquisition. And also you'll see in here in a minute, the uh, cost of a lead. We typically know that there's many stages in healthcare, right? There's a lead, then it becomes qualified, then they might schedule a consult, mm -hmm. then they eventually might become a full-time patient. So as Rich mentioned, the better we can set this up so we con we're confident that each stage converts to the next at this rate, now we can just back into the math and make sure we feel confident about the numbers. All right. So... Rob, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what a 
holistic digital performance plan, this, this output that we're essentially getting to, right, with our goal setting, right? We, we know we need to get, you know, location A, we need to get 30 patients. So the work, this is essentially once all the work has been done, talk to us a little bit about what we end up with. Yeah, so at the end, what we get, uh, which is probably a lot more granular than what you're looking at here, but for the sake of, you know, everyone's eyeballs, we tried to give a snapshot, um, is you really get that that plan, right? This this is the plan that we're setting off from the port with, right? This is the combination of our different conversion rates by the different acquisition, you know, from calls to forms to bookings. It is our investment strategy across the different channels. It is the you know, effectively micro goals that we're all roll up to our macro success. Uh, and it's effectively where, you know, we've placed our bets um, in how we plan to attack, you know, this coming year. Now that said, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? Um, and what I think a key thing about these plans is that you need to be comfortable changing them, right? You need to be comfortable sort of feeding the machine. to succeed, right? You know, a good example is work with a client who we had goals, uh, to Evan's point, of increasing uh, our conversion rates, right? So we expected to increase conversion rates a bit, right? And then we had certain levels of volume we had to achieve to multiply through that a conversion rate to get the patients. Turned out we struggled to increase that conversion rate, but we were really good that year at driving a ton of lead volume, right? So though you could argue, oh no, right? We didn't exactly hit our plan, but we did hit the goal, right? And that's where we leaned into where we were succeeding and we doubled down, right? Um, and we were able to achieve the goals, even though the plan did, you know, look a bit different, right? By the end of that year. Um, and that's still a success, right? We, we live in a sort of a, a liquid environment. We just don't know what competitors or, you know, how these different channels are going to be impacted by the market. Um, you know, it's an election year next year something's going to happen. We don't know what it is exactly yet, but we are prepared to shift and to have those discussions, right? Um, and that, you know, that's what will separate, you know, the good and the great. And the point here is, you know, once you have these, these detailed plans laid out, everybody inside of the organization and every partner that you're working with to achieve these things knows exactly what you're aiming at, right? I mean, you can take the, the goal numbers, and you can see exactly how they've been broken down into digital contribution, non-digital contribution, what we think the estimated cost is going to be to get to deliver those things, why we're making the assumptions that we're making, what our lead patient rate is. I mean, it's all here. So there can be no confusion, right? Every, everybody gets it and everybody is driving towards that same objective. Um, I think lastly, because I know we are about to run out of time, I think the one last thought that we'll we'll leave you guys with is, and we've already touched on this uh, a little bit <laughs> before ad nauseum, is just make sure that you understand the interplay between channels for accurate forecasting, right? So oftentimes, you know, somebody who's less familiar with digital, uh, less, maybe less sophisticated as, as a marketer will come in and they'll look at that plan that you put out and they're saying, I don't want to spend $10,000 on paid social, or I don't want to spend $10,000 on display because you're telling me it's got a $500 CPA. Like just go, go do more organic, go do more search, not realizing that oftentimes conversion paths start with paid social in the top of the funnel or in the middle of the funnel, or they'll start with display or native or programmatic video even. So it's really key that you think about assists, you know, channel assists, view through conversions, um, you know, if you can do multi-touch attribution, it's it's important to do so, so that you really understand the true contribution of some of these more inefficient, but further up the funnel channels that really make the downstream magic happen, right? And so you definitely don't want to end up, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater um, and essentially creating too much pressure at the bottom of the funnel that will ultimately lead to additional inefficiency. Um, I know we're at time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for walking us through this tour de force. Um, the great news is we'll leave you with this deck. There is a summary of, of planning steps laid out here for you to follow if you're going through your own goal exercise. And we now have an hour-long Q&A session where we can answer any questions from this session and any other questions from other scaling up sessions. Um, and that will begin right now. So we hope to see you over there. Thank you so much.